in the last lecture i introduced uh, the topic of legged gurg inequality it is a inequality based on multiple measurements on the same system but in some sequence in time you can measure certain correlations and uh, it has been labeled as a test of macro realism so you have to redefine what are the basic assumptions under this scenario and there are three one of them is that at any instant the system is in one of the allowed states seems quite logical the second is that if you perform any measurement of the system you can design the measurement uh so that the system is perturbed only slightly this is certainly true in a classical uh, scenario quantum scenario that is something that can be questioned and the third assumption is that events in the future cannot change events in the past okay that um uh, is quite logical because otherwise we will have lots of trouble in explaining our world so these are the three basic uh, assumptions and based on this legat and gurg derived an inequality um the simplest example just happens to be measurement of one qubit at multiple instances of time and all you can measure with one qubit is a polymetric nothing more than that but polymetric you can choose the direction which direction you want to measure sigma x sigma y sigma z some superposition etc that you can choose and that uh, is something which is varied to find the contradiction uh, in this particular example so let me uh, write down the basic uh, uh assumption there is something which is a correlation function which is some operator at time ti another operator it doesn't have to be the same at time tj and then you measure the two point uh, correlation function for qubits uh and this measurement result is just going to be plus or minus one you are measuring a polymetric okay and then you calculate uh, some combinations of uh, this uh, correlation function and there is the three point uh, relation which is combination of three measurements and different correlation between what happened at time 1 time 2 and time 3 can construct this after performing some measurements and this obeys certain bounds it's quite obvious that you have three numbers because of this the number can only uh, be in the values plus 1 and minus 1 when you choose an eigen state and so you have three numbers each one of them is either plus 1 or minus 1 so add it in all possible ways it can take only four discrete values minus 3 minus 1 1 and 3 just adding up all possible three it cannot go outside okay so this uh 
is a, has a bound. It has only four values classically. But now you can do little more. And because these things are entered in certain combination with a negative sign here, you immediately realize that if I list all the possibilities, the number plus three cannot occur. Because plus three to occur, all these three things have to be equal to the same result, but there is a minus sign in here. And so plus three required that all three have to be plus one, including the minus sign, which is not allowed because this looks like a product of these two. So other three values can occur. You can assign some values over there and uh, they are completely okay. And so there is a very simple uh, classical bound. which is a minus three. Actually it is only integers, but yeah, you can take afterwards that there is some superposition or in the classical world, some probabilistic combination. It cannot go from the outside the minimum and the maximum values. Of course, now we have to show that this is violated in the quantum theory by choosing a particular kind of operator. So that is uh, the test and uh, well, I can point out uh, the related uh, scenario that there is a four time version. So which is a k4 uh, equal to 1, 2, plus 2, 3, plus 3, 4, minus 3, 4, 1. And uh, again, you can look for all the numbers, plus 1 and minus 1 adding up. So the minimum value can be plus four and then it can be, sorry, minimum is minus four, then minus two, zero, plus two and plus four. Those are the kind of combination you add up from plus minus one. But again, you ask the question that there is a minus sign stuck in over here. And so plus four required everything together, but this looks like a product of these three. Uh, it cannot happen. And similarly, minus four also doesn't happen and you can list explicitly the possibility the analog of this thing is a minus two less than or equal to k4 less than or equal to two and this is a related to the other inequality which I described in the last lecture called CHSH inequality. It had four terms. One of them had a negative sign and this was exactly the bound on the classical uh, version of it and quantum mechanics violated. So this is actually something which can be nicely converted from one language to another. I'm not going to discuss this, but it is uh, something which can be handled uh, easily. And then you ask if you are going to perform a mapping, what is the assumption in this time-like case, um, which is kind of replacement of the corresponding assumption in the space-like case? Because here it again had certain assumption and uh, that mapping will tell you that uh, uh, locality, in CHSH uh, case is uh, replaced by uh, what you call non-invasive measurement. 
that as I mentioned before, there is an assumption here that the quantity, whatever the operator is, can be measured without any disturbance and that was an assumption which replaces this uh, locality for hidden variables in the case of CHSH inequality. The other assumptions are the same in both cases that uh, system is in one of the states or uh, the future cannot change something which happened in the past. That um, is not changed but there was a unique uh, status for locality here. In this case it is this and if you do that all these things exactly map onto this particular situation. So now let us uh, ask what happens in quantum mechanics. So the operator I will measure it polymetric along some unit direction in three dimensional space. Let's call it R. But you have to follow all the rules of uh, quantum mechanics, which uh, will tell you that when you do that, the state gets projected. So after uh, one measurement, you have a projected state and on that projected state you perform the other next measurement. There is a time order uh, specifically, you have to follow that. And so you measure this and uh, what is the consequence? So it will get either plus one or minus one. So I will write it in a compact language. So the result is say some value r, r is going to be plus 1 or minus 1, yeah. Uh, when you say we can map CHSH to the uh, temporal uh, inequality, are you saying that in case of CHSH we have taken two qubits and the correlation between the, those two? Yeah. Whereas in case of uh, this temporal inequality we have only one qubit and different types? Two measurements, two measurements on the same qubit. Ah, so those both are related? Yeah. It's a, what you call, analogy, okay? It's not a mathematical mapping. Space-like measurements are very different than time-like measurements. I cannot convert one to another by any rules of physics. But it's a analogous in the structure of mathematics which shows up. Yeah. So, that uh, means in this case there is no, uh, like, entanglement in the world. There is like no question of entanglement. These are all time-like measurement on the same system. All that happens is a projection. When you measure it, state gets projected. Okay. So, uh, okay, result of R and uh, projection operator. is a uh, one half identity plus r times i'm just writing it in a particular notation so do you have a projection operator in the direction R, which is, uh, you can write it as generic uh, notation, whatever you choose. And you get two eigenvalues, but the projection operator for the positive eigenvalue will be identity plus this and the projection operator for the negative identity eigenvalue will be identity minus this. So just a generalization of what you may have used many times that 
if I measure the third component, the projection of trajectory will be I plus sigma 3 or I minus sigma 3, depending on which eigenvalue you get. Okay. So you now do this first measurement, you take the state, result will be R and this will be the projection operator. Second measurement, there will be some other projection operator, some other result and then you take the expectation value overall possible uh, scenario and uh, it's a straightforward exercise but again in case of uh, analogous result which were uh, seen in case of uh, the two qubit correlation you can easily work out that this thing Uh, gets only what you call a symmetric contribution which is the anti-commutator of whatever these two operators is but expectation value is important uh, when you do this, these are all poly matrices and the anti-symmetric combination just cancel out, whatever it is. And the symmetric part survives and the result is, uh, uh, well I use this notation, so let me uh, denote these are the two measurement operators and the result of this correlation function is just a dot product. It's basically coming from the fact where both are same sigma matrices and the operator is a sigma dot r. So the symmetric part will just give you r dot with s. These are the two directions. Nothing complicated than that, you just use the standard rules, calculate the expectation value, take the trace of product of two poly matrices and the result is just a dot product, which is the angle between the two measurement directions. Now comes the peculiarity of quantum mechanics that if I take this direction to be either parallel or perpendicular, nothing happens, okay, you will get exact eigenvalues and uh, the result will be the same as what you get classically. But in quantum case, you can choose directions which are not parallel and which are not orthogonal, something in the superposition. And then uh, you can check what are the allowed values of this uh, number and then this particular combination. So, uh, I have to now do some notation. Okay, let me simplify this. I and Rj, which is a notation I wrote over here. So, yeah. Yeah, that you can choose in quantum theory. The first you measure along this axis, second you measure along some other axis. The same state, one after the other. So now this will become a R1 dot R2 plus R2 dot R3 minus R3 dot R1. And you want to 
look at the extreme values because you want to somehow check the bounds on uh, this particular quantity and in general there are three vectors and they can point in three dimensional space or anyway but you can convince yourself by just little bit of imagination that that overall magnitude will be the largest when the three vectors are coplanar okay so then the magnitudes will add up to kind of a maximum uh, situation if you go outside the two dimensional plane then some other component uh, will come and the overall magnitude will reduce so in this particular case magnitude uh, is And once you convince yourself that I have to have three vectors and uh, want to maximize this thing in two dimensional uh, plane, it is easy. So this uh, will become basically cosine of the angle between this. three vectors and now you want to find the largest uh, value and it's uh, quite easy to try out various combination you want these two to be positive and that one to be negative so the value is large and then you if you want to do it you can do what to call explicit maximization by taking the derivatives it's not too complicated because now it's in a plane you can uh, write it as a three variables so now you can write the theta 1 minus theta 2 this is theta 2 minus theta 3 etc and uh, differentiate spread the derivative equal to 0 and solve the equation um, it can be done, I will just give you the answer uh, which comes out that uh, the maximum value of this thing is uh, occurs where so these are directions where 1 2 and 3 where the angles are pi over 3 And you can find it very easily. Cosine of pi over 3. Pi over 3 is 60 degrees. That is half. And this last one will be cosine of 120 degrees. Which will be minus half. And so this number becomes 3 half. Which is going outside this bound. So this is the result from an experiment measuring one qubit is not too difficult even with the limited uh, technology which we have and comes this is correct. You can actually try out all possible angles in all geometries and see whether quantum agreement works for this particular formula. Yes, it works. And then the question is, uh, what has 
turned out to be different than this classical assumption. And uh, certainly it's all related to the case that these directions are not parallel and not orthogonal. Put in something else. And it produces uh, results. And that follows from the fact that polymatrices in this particular combinations, they don't commute. So certainly this is uh, related to these two objects not commuting with each other. And one can uh, verify that uh, one can actually check that suppose I construct this as a magnitude rather. So it's uh, going to be imaginary. These are two Hermitian operators. Commutator of two Hermitian operators will be imaginary. So you can um, construct it, factor out the i and all that kind of stuff to find what is the magnitude. And uh, it's polymatrices, not too difficult if you have evaluated all those things with this projection operators. Constructing this thing is a kind of a straightforward and that this commutator is maximized in this particular configuration. Local maximum in the sense that the commutator has many extrema, minima and maxima, whatever it is. So this particular configuration corresponds to a local maximum. So this is what has happened. You measured something which was classically quite okay because you had this eigenvalue acted like numbers, but in quantum mechanics, your operators, they may not commute and uh, it give peculiarities and uh, there is no analog of non-commutativity in classical physics. And so now comes the question that these had three assumptions, what went wrong? And uh, the common uh, explanation is that this non-invasive measurement part uh, has to be given up for the same reason that yes, you are using projection operator and things are uh, changing just like in Bell's case, the locality assumption was given up. There had to be non-local uh, correlation, which is fine. It's a valid explanation, but the quantum mechanics allows you to do different things and uh, um, you have to leave it open that are there any other combination in particularly the first assumption that the quantum state is in one of the possible allowed states at every instant of time whether it is valid or not. And one of the possibilities is that the state does not have a definite value until you measure it. You cannot have this, uh, what you call, classical uh, picture of reality, which I explained as this uh, ontology label in the previous lecture which says that the system has a state, whether you observe it or not, doesn't matter. But it is an open question in quantum theory that that assumption did not be true. The system gets a state only when you measure it. Otherwise, you don't know what it is. That remains an open question. 
So this is a well story of uh, legged gag inequality. Again, correlations of polymatrices, which is all you need to do. You measure it uh, and you get an answer, which is clearly different in classical version versus the quantum calculation. And uh, yeah, it has become a well-known test uh, for doing all kinds of things. Incidentally, Laguerre get a, got a Nobel Prize, though not for this particular topic. Do for condensed matter physics. Okay. So that is uh, well the story, and in all kind of inequalities, uh, there is one thing which you have to keep in mind that. There is a classical bound, but the, there is an upper bound also. that uh, how much will be the violation when it goes outside. For example, here in case you can say that if I just look at plus or minus, the three plus three was an allowed value. I could go up to three by two. Can I do more? The answer is no. Even though I means just looking at plus minus number, the numbers could have been three, that doesn't uh, happen, it's not so trivial, but there is a upper bound. In this particular case, it is a three by two. In case of a CHSH inequality, which I discussed last time, this uh, number went from two to two times root two, but you could not do anything more. So there is an upper bound and uh, you can actually derive that upper bound uh, from the principle of uh, unitarity. That you can violate it, but you cannot violate it by arbitrary amount. There is a maximum uh, violation and with some work you can find out what is that maximum violation. I'm not going to do that, but just wanted to point it out. Okay, so in these inequalities, you have a classical bound, you have a unitarity bound, and when you measure, you took a configuration which uh, gives some values in that particular range and you have to actually check uh, that the error bar on this measurement is a small enough uh, compared to whatever the actual uh, violation you expect because experimentally whatever you measure will have some error bar and you want the error bar to be small enough so that whatever the number you get is still sufficiently outside uh, this particular range. And so people thought a little bit more and uh, came up with a scenario where you do not have to deal with the error bar. Just get a direct answer, uh, which is some distinct value. And so you bypass measuring the inequality and the test. Just one measurement uh, tells you whether quantum mechanics is right or the classical argument is right. And I will now give you that particular example which uh, is called GHZ test. These are the three initials, Greenberger, Horn and Zeilinger. And Zeilinger is again the same person um, who got the Nobel Prize last year and 
part of his uh, contribution is developing this test and then experimentally realizing it. So this will be a, just a distinct situation. Classical physics gives you one answer. Quantum physics gives you another answer. The two answers are distinct. You don't have to calculate some correlation function or something like that. Just that looking at the two answers, you say that, okay, this works and this doesn't work. So I will phrase it in the kind of test uh, in a puzzle form of manner and then see what uh, can be done. So it actually it's, uh, requires at least three qubit situation. This uh, inequality you could do with two qubits or one qubit measured at two instances. This you need a little larger system, three qubit system. But what you are going to do is uh, measure two different uh, operators. on each qubit and they have a certain uh, properties that values are going because they are qubit operators I will write them as polymatrices and the values are going to be plus one or minus one okay nothing else So I now measure different uh, combinations that let them uh, called A, B and B, the two operators, okay. So let me write the notation. So I measure this particular quantities, okay, A1, B2, B3, then B1, A2, B3, and I will take a state and I will measure this and this and this. It doesn't matter in which order I measure. I can measure this first and that first or this first and the second. Every time I get the same answer. I have not yet defined what A and B are. So the answers are always plus one for all three. No matter what order I measure. So the state is eigenstate of all the three. 
so now what can you say about uh, the combination It's a product of all these three because of the situation that everything B1, B2, B3 are getting squared. And the numbers are supposed to be plus or minus one. So if the state is such that it has specific values of A1, B1, whatever it is, uh, at every instant of time. You can measure this in any order and you have a prediction that well everything has some value. The order doesn't matter. I multiply all the three. Individually they were plus one. So the classical prediction is plus one. Just the product of these three, there's in some it's a some combination of But these three people then constructed a quantum state where the answer is minus one. or the particular state. Doesn't look very complicated, but it's an entangled state. And you have to ask now, answer the question, what are the operators? The transfer always plus one, meaning that in the case of classical... Because individually these three objects are all given plus one. I can combine the result, assuming that the system is always in some particular eigenstate. And if I take a product of these three numbers, B1 gets squared, B2 gets squared, B3 gets squared, all the squared stuff is 1. And what I am left is A1, A2, A3, that is the value which I am looking for. But what is classical prediction for equilibrium? There is no classical prediction, these are the measurements, just the measurement results. The result of the measurement is always classical. So I am asking, what will be the result of measuring this particular combination on the same state. That is something I can ask. How the state came from is a different state. Is this again normalized? Hmm? Is this again normalized? They are eigenstates. Yeah, they are non-invasive measurements. That problem always removed because this, the system is in an eigenstate. When you measure it, nothing is going to happen to the system. And 
the answer for this is a is equal to sigma 1 and b is equal to sigma 2. So let, let's just check this, okay? What happens? They are indeed eigenstates or not? Both sigma 1 and sigma 2 uh, flip 0 and 1. Sigma 1 it flips, the sign is always plus 1. Sigma 2 will interchange 0 and 1 and uh, sometimes there will be a plus i and sometimes there will be a minus i. That depends on whether you go from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. That plus or i minus i is not going to matter because it's going to get squared. So square of plus i is also minus 1 and square of minus i is also minus 1. So now ask what happens here. A1, um, this 0 will become 1. B2, this 0 will become 1 up to a factor of plus i or minus i. This one will become also the same factor, etc. So it will become 1, 1, 1. That uh, plus or I, I or minus i is going to get squared, so it is going to flip sign. So it will be 1, 1, 1, then the plus or minus i whole thing squared will give the minus sign. Same thing over here. Uh, 1 will go to 0 because of sigma 1, and this plus or minus i will flip sign. There is a negative sign over here, so it will become 0, 0, 0. So it's an indeed an eigenstate of this. And because it's completely symmetric, it's an eigenstate of all these things as well. So that is fine. Now ask what really happens when you try this operator on the same state. It flips all of them, but this is a sigma 1 operator. So 0, 0, 0 will become 1, 1, 1. This is 1, 1, 1 becomes 0, 0, 0. Minus sign is there. So what happened? Okay, these, you are not even worried about non-orthogonal direction, anything of that sort. These are nice orthogonal uh, components. Everything is an eigenstate. And you have to scratch your head a little bit to, to figure out what uh, actually got uh, changed. But the setup is very simple. You prepare this state somehow or the other, where well, you have to work out all the combinations of uh, photons to make this particular state, which is what Zeilinger did here to make a design of a certain sources and create this particular combination. But the point is this is a very specific state and even if it is prepared probabilistically it is fine. Sometimes you will prepare something else, you will uh, um, perform a test of any of these eigen operators and you can, you can remove all the orthogonal components which are of no use. So even if it is probabilistic uh, you can project it by all these nice operators, so it is definitely in the state. And afterwards, you just have to perform one particular measurement along some direction and see whether the answer is plus one or it is minus one. And that's that thing, you don't have to do any expectation value, nothing like that, just a specific result. It tells you whether uh, which of the possibilities is right. And of course, experiment says that this is right every time you do it. Okay. So, experimentally, this three qubit state can be Created probabilistically and then put it.
So yeah, now let me give the answer as well. What happens if I just take these three operators and multiply them with these particular choices? They are all eigen operators, so I don't have to worry about uh, projections. But then you see that the three operators, these are all tensor products. So you can reorganize them so that it acts whatever acts on first qubit, whatever acts on second qubit, whatever acts on third qubit. They don't uh, complicate each other. But now you look at the product. Uh, well, these are simple operators. Whatever is sigma 2 is there, sigma 2 squared is identity. That's not, not going to get uh, disturbed either. And here also, this thing sigma 2 squared is going to be identity. But here, before you get to the identity, you have to go through one of the sigma 1. You will cancel it, b2 and b2, but it went through sigma 1 and sigma 1 and sigma 2 anticommute. And so you get all the cancellation, but one anticommutation sitting inside here does the job of the giving the quantum answer minus 1. So the result And that is the part which has no analog in the classical description. Non-commuting operators are really a peculiarity of quantum mechanics. And it has all kind of uh, consequences. Probably the first thing uh, which you encountered was the uncertainty principle. The two operators don't commute then you take something like position and momentum, the commutator is equal to some multiple of Planck's constant and that Planck's constant is not zero, that is where the whole quantum theory starts. And here I'm not using any specific units, so Planck's constant doesn't appear, everything is normalized where whatever the commutator it is equal to one in some units, which is actually the Planck's constant in some disguised form. And that is uh, well, all kind of peculiarity uh, which are connected to direct uh, measurement of experimental systems. That yes, you do this, experiment tells you that the classical logic has to stop at some stage. And why all this thing is important? Because it gets connected to the fact that when you develop quantum algorithms, which are the situations where you will get an advantage. And the advantage will occur when you are using this type of properties in some clever manner. If you don't use those uh, tricks, there will be no advantage in a quantum computer. But these are actually the simplest things which um, have put the, whatever, the quantum physics on a very strong footing and the complicated problem which people are now trying to apply these uh, things for 
is a use of these cartoonal properties. And it also makes it obvious that you have to be very clever in designing um, problems so that these features are buried inside this. If you take an arbitrary problem and say that there will be an improvement of quantum computing, <laughs> that may not be true. Okay, the very specific structures are needed. And uh, there are uh, relations for that which I will uh, now try to illustrate by yet another language um, which comes very close to the classical uh, logic. So you can actually talk about various kind of uh, logic gates and uh, which are the peculiarities of those logic gates, etc., um, which can help you in developing algorithm. And that uh, subject is called Wigner functions. When Wigner constructed uh, this uh, structure, he just wrote it down. Didn't have to explain anything, uh, whatever detail, etc. And it was actually in the appendix of the paper. It was not even the main paper. Oh, this is true. It's so written in the appendix. But uh, then all the follow-up uh, derivations based on this particular simple structure showed all the peculiarities of quantum theory. Then that is uh, where the description is useful and the mapping it performs uh, through the classical language is uh, through the language of what is called a phase space. So, so this is a analog of description of a state. And uh, if you have come across what is the phase space, fine. Otherwise, I will quickly define uh, it for you. Phase space is made up of two conjugate variables. Uh, And the simplest one, which is used all the time, is position and momentum. Okay. So in all the classical mechanics, the evolution equations are second order equation. And so if you are given an initial state, you want to find its evolution, you need uh, two values, position and the derivative which is velocity or momentum. And all the analysis of uh, Lagrangian mechanics or Hamiltonian mechanics or whatever it is, if you are given x and p, you can find its trajectory. This is how it is going to evolve. And uh, evolution is in some coordinates, you can plot it in the function of x and p, two dimensional space, some trajectory. And it's completely okay. And what Wigner function does is construct a structure which just looks like that phase space uh, description, but with one caveat that X and P are not going to commute in quantum theory. So what happens? Can you find a description of that particular type? So.
so i will exactly do that define a function in terms of x and p and uh, show that you can exploit that particular function by going over to the language which can be related to all the other structures which we have used before so what we have defined is a two variable function let me stick to the notation which is quite standard this is a planck's constant i'm just using the standard like you can write it 2 pi h cross if you want but this is the same thing then an integral of uh, this particular term okay this is i have to put h bar over here otherwise 2 pi over that doesn't matter i will use so it uses psi and star and psi but at different points and whatever is the difference in the coordinate is put inside the phase for fourier transform so in some sense it's a fourier transform in relative coordinates i think i messed it up a little bit there should not be a dx so x is there p is there p is used as a standard fourier type from prescription but fourier transform in what coordinate that well, that is the difference between these two and so you will get some function of x and p no problem in uh, definition question is what are the properties of this particular function you have to remember that x and p are going to become operators so something peculiarity will be there but writing this function there is no problem because i can define psi of x with this change coordinates and x psi star x this one and this the fourier transform the function has no ambiguity in the definition at all and if you want to write it uh in a little bit lang related language which i will use uh later on for the discrete variable set particularly that this combination psi star and psi is nothing but the density matrix with these two arguments they are not the same it is off diagonal component of the density matrix something like that and you are taking that and fourier transform with respect to the difference of the two components okay so now this brings in all the power of uh, quantum theory you are going to look at a peculiar uh, construction starting from the density matrix there is no trace and this is a 
in a continuous language uh, of uh, quantum theory where x and p are one dimensional variables going from minus infinity to infinity. I will come to the discrete case how it will change when you want to say construct this for a qubit. There the variables are not continuous but here they are continuous variables and they are genuine integrals. This is a wave function. They are, they are all complex numbers. There are no commutation. There are no operators here. We are relating this with quantum mechanics. You can define the quantum mechanics can be completely defined in terms of wave function and uh, certain coordinates and you can do Fourier transform. There are no operator ambiguities here at all. These integrals if you want they are real. So now I can uh, ask what is uh, This object integrated over one of the coordinates p. Nothing else depends on p, so it is integral of just this phase, and we know what that integral is a delta function. Delta function of y. That means the result is y is equal to 0. And so the result is nothing but well put y equal to 0 and do the integral, the normal relations exactly are chosen. So everything cancels out and you can get the probability density. What if you integrate over the other variable? Well, you have to take this uh, whole definition and uh, integrate over x from here. And uh, for that reason, it's convenient to do the integral in two steps. First, you write y as a difference between this coordinate and that coordinate. So then you have integral dx dy and uh, one of them will be transformed to this coordinate, the another one will be transformed to that coordinate and uh, this term separates into two phases. One goes with this, other goes with that and that happens to be The Fourier transform wave function squared in momentum space. There. Yeah, it's the p times this uh, minus that. 
Yeah, that's okay. So if you define this wave function, you split it up into two phases. One goes with this and another goes with that. And you have a double integral, which is just uh, psi tilde p, and the other one is its complex conjugate, the whole thing gets squared. So what is now this representing in a phase space? So, so WXP is a phase space distribution. Who's a uh, marginals So it's an object where you are defining it in two dimensional space but you just integrate over one of the coordinates completely and those things are called marginals okay either this or that depending on whether you integrate out x or you integrate out p and that gives you the density which is what you can directly measure in experiment why this is uh, required well because even though this conjugates Conjugate coordinates cannot be measured simultaneously. I can say I'm going to measure X precisely and I don't care about P. And then the prescription will be, what is the result? When X is precise, P is anything arbitrary, I just integrate over it. And then I exactly get what I uh, expect. And I have to do this uh, reduction, which is called this marginal because I can either measure x or I can measure p but the uncertainty principle will not allow me to measure both of them simultaneously. And then everything is okay so x and So this is fine, I get the probability density. So if I integrate everything, uh, these numbers are going to be positive, bounded by greater than or equal to zero. But then what does the peculiarity of those phases do? And now you can ask, what is a extra property of this particular object? And that can be seen very easily in this uh, description. I look at its complex conjugate. If I do a complex conjugate, psi star will become psi and psi will become psi star. But the phase will also change psi. And so I can absorb that extra sign by changing y to minus y, which will compensate this. This disappeared, but this will become plus y by 2. This will become minus y by 2. So this quantity is real, even though described in uh, one particular manner. And that's a 
great advantage, got rid of all the complex numbers. But peculiarity of quantum mechanics is still sitting inside there. Somehow, even with all these numbers positive, that you can get a positive number in a distribution by summing up some places positive and some places negative. All the individual terms are all real. And this is the advantage of uh, Wigner functions. You constructed something consistent with all the rules of quantum mechanics. You don't have to deal with complex numbers anymore. Everything can be done. Um, why? Because all the observables can be written as trace of density matrix times some operator. You have the density matrix sitting over here. So all observable quantities can be deduced from that. Complex numbers are gone, but little bit of quantum mechanics is left and those are these negative values. And they have consequences. So I will, uh, well today it's getting close to over. I will describe this structure in the discrete language in the next class, but let me point out uh, some of these uh, standard definitions which are all fully consistent with quantum theory just in case of uh, normalization and uh, one of them is uh, this uh, Trace of rho is equal to 1, which I can do it from this language, which means that if I take this function and integrate over everything, I will get 1. That's the normalization. I can write it for a generic operator which is here it will be identity what is uh, this particular object which is all the observables and I can use any of this uh, notation uh, to define it if I use a particular this notation x rho is of some function of x, operator is some function of x, but you can write it in uh, many different ways. So let me write it just one way. Then rho of this notation x minus y by 2, x plus y by 2, and the other integral actually comes from the trace. And the operator also has to be defined in the same split point uh, notation because uh, how was this defined in the say a discrete case? This trace rho times O was rho ij and oji. That's how I will write it in the matrix. Rho ij is uh, related to these two arguments being different. And OIJ, well, you have to take a Hermitian conjugate, doesn't matter, but uh, it can be defined as uh, again the same split point indices. Uh, up in this O is, if you want the rho IJ, GOGI, you take a Hermitian conjugate and convert it, but you can uh, do that very easily because of this particular peculiarity that everything is going to be real. I don't have to worry too much about. Uh, 
complex conjugation uh, and involved in the Hermitian uh, part. The only thing is the indices are flipped, so to be more correct, I should have kept it that. Rho ij o j i will produce a trace. Yeah. Yeah. It acts on psi, or here it is rho. I'm using the continuum language. You write a Schrodinger equation for x and p, there will be an operator. Operator will be some f of x, and the integral will be calculate this expectation value. Matrix language I will come to later, but these are all related. Just written in the continuous variable case where you are given some function psi, you are given some operator O, you have to integrate over that coordinate. And so now let me do this rather trivial exercise of converting into Wigner function language. I want to rewrite in this and the integrals will become x and p. So, introduce this dummy variable for uh, rho and uh, whatever you takes you to the Wigner function. Uh, I am, this is a Fourier transform and to write this in terms of them, I am using the inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so this, take it on the other side and that is what it looks like and I will need both of these, uh, sub, another one for the operator. So there are two variables P and Q. And the two Fourier transform. So O of X and Q and uh, it has its phase, but because this order was different, here it is minus IPY, here it is plus IQY. Okay. So now the integrals can be done uh, rather easily in some order. Easiest to do is uh, integral over y. It has only two phases and you know the answer. What it happens, it creates a delta function. And these two signs are opposite, so the delta function will be p equal to q. And that delta function can be now integrated p equal to q, another integral is gone. So, let me write it in there are probably some convention for uh, normalization, but so it's fine. Um, the final result looks out uh, quite simple and it's as if this distribution is nothing but a weighted average in this joint space of x and p. There is a density 
and this is the value at that point. Okay, and uh, that's it. So you can interpret that any calculation. I mean, the trivial example is actually O equal to identity. So everything will disappear, and you will get that. That's a case. The only thing which you have to keep in mind that this O x p uh, has to be. Mm. I wrote it as a function of x and p, but it's kind of implicit in all the quantum theory that uh, whatever this thing is, it has to correspond to a Hermitian operator. Okay. So x you can take, x is Hermitian, no problem by itself, but p is a, has a certain structure. If you want to write it as the x space, it is one over i times a gradient. And you have to put that one over i in front of the gradient so that the operator is Hermitian. If you have a cross term, it is also fine x times p. x times p is not Hermitian by itself. But then you take a Hermitian conjugate. So Hermitian conjugate of xp is px. x and p both are Hermitian, but the order reverse. So whatever comes here has to be corresponding to xp plus px. It cannot be just xp and it cannot be xp minus px either. Because this whole thing has to go back to the usual quantum mechanics. This has to be a Hermitian operator in some particular form. So that is a restriction and uh, then everything goes through. You have a distribution, you have some definition of an operator on this, you do the integrals and you get whatever expectation value you want. And peculiarity is that so in some places things can be negative. And how is uh, that going to influence uh, the interpretation of the in the phase space that generic uh, whatever this thing is is um, For this you have to work a little bit, but I'm writing down the answer. Quantum mechanics X and P simultaneously cannot be defined, but you can define an elemental area, which is dx dp. And uh, what is the normalization for that elemental area? It shows up in this formula as the Planck's constant. X times P has the same dimension as that of Planck's constant. So what is happening here, classically, you had a point. But quantum mechanically, that point has become smeared over an area of unit H. And individual point distribution may go negative over here, but a physical space will be a smeared state. 
and for that the value will be positive and this is a underlying feature which is important to understand to give a what to call interpretation or the intuition about what is going on and actually this appears in different places in different ways phase space is quantized it is not just a point by point distribution it is certain unit areas of certain size distributed all over the place and it is actually used heavily in quantum statistics where you count the number of states and if you have encountered it any a uh, course in quantum mechanics you will calculate the uh, number of states and then how many states are there when divide by planck's constant so it's a standard deviation for all this uh, fermi dirac distribution or bose einstein distribution whatever it is you generate the area integral dx dp divided by planck's constant and those are the number of states which are present so it it goes back all the way over there that why the quantum theory does what it does that the phase space is completely okay it is a uh, maps to the classical uh, hamiltonian uh, structure but it is going to be quantized in a uh, uh, the quantum description or what i wrote over here the states physical states are they are smeared object and all the non triviality is connected to the fact that if you are looking at only the smeared objects it will map onto the classical description very nicely but you go and ask things about what is happening in the interior of that particular smearing and all the features of quantum mechanics appear there inside that particular smearing the wigner function actually goes negative uh inside that area but if you integrate over the area it becomes positive and that can be illustrated by just constructing various examples and working out what is the wigner function um directly there are certain cases where uh, no negative number appears and uh, those are known uh, the simplest example is gaussian if you have gaussian wave function you know this wave is gaussian you do a fourier transform that is also gaussian everything positive no negative numbers appear anywhere and so if you have just gaussian states you are not going to see any peculiarity of quantum mechanics anyway even though the gaussian you may have derived using schrodinger equation but there will be other solutions where things will go up and down not gaussians but uh, more tricky situations and there these features are present and they will do non trivial things yeah no the shape is variable we can go all the way to the case where this it gets stretched out to be a line shape is uh, not defined and uh, in different problems uh, you have to actually be clever enough to choose a particular shape if you want to get an answer which is analytically nice looking 
but yeah, the shape can be um, adjusted. And there is actually a powerful theorem which uh, goes back all the way to classical physics. Uh, goes under the name of Lewis theorem in Hamiltonian dynamics. That under Hamiltonian dynamics, the, you take some area, it gets re-adjusted or distorted, etc. But uh, the volume remains unchanged. So that goes through in quantum theory, no problem. Only thing is that area is now not a arbitrary point, it is in units of Planck's constant. So these are all the features uh, which are there and it actually allows you to come very close to the classical description in this uh, phase space structure and next time I will now convert this to qubits where we are going to work and see what kind of results uh, will uh, arise from that. <laughs>